Near the banks of the Volga River, a funeral ship blazes brightly against the dusk. The body of a Viking chieftain and his most cherished possessions crumble to soot and ash. Looking on, fascinated, is a man who has traveled over 2,500 miles, far from his home of Baghdad. He has traveled here to serve as a religious advisor for the newly converted people of Volga, Bulgaria. But it's another people who've captivated his attention, his admiration, and even his disgust. The Rus Vikings. This episode is sponsored by Audible. Start your own audiobook adventures today by visiting the link in the description below. In the year 921, the Khan of Volga, Bulgaria sent ambassadors to Baghdad asking for military and financial aid in return for conversion to Islam. In response, the Abbasid Caliph sent a delegation that included a faqih, an expert in Islamic law and religious practice, named Ahmed ibn Fadlan. In the tradition of Islamic travel writing, Ibn Fadlan chronicled the year-long journey from Baghdad and described the cultures and people he encountered along the way. A bit like the much later, much more famous world traveler and side trip aficionado, Ibn Battuta. But not long after Ibn Fadlan began working in the Khan's court, imparting the religious and administrative knowledge of Baghdad, a group of Rus arrived and set up camp along the river to trade. Part of the Viking expansion, the Rus were one offshoot of a group that left Scandinavia a century before seeking trade routes and kingdoms to plunder, which, if you're so inclined, you can learn more about over in our Viking expansion series. Now settled in Eastern Europe, the Rus traded northern commodities like fur, wax, and slaves captured in war for silk, silver, and other luxuries from the east and south. Their presence was not unusual to the Volga Bulgars. Because the Volga River ran through the center of the state, the Bulgars had access to trade with all manner of places and cultures. Baghdad and Constantinople in the south, Europe to the west, China to the east, and to the north, of course, Rus Vikings. But while the Bulgars were used to the Rus, they were like nothing that Ibn Fadlan had ever seen before. I have never seen more perfect physical specimens, he wrote. Tall as date palms, blonde and ruddy. Each man has an axe, a sword, and a knife, and keeps each by him at all times. They are tattooed from fingernail to neck with dark green symbols. Oh, that's right. Shirtless, blonde, tattooed, armed to the teeth, and physically perfect. Uh, what? What? Where was I? Oh yeah, that's right. The Vikings were skilled jewelry makers as well. By Ibn Fadlan's account, for every 10,000 silver a man was worth, he would make a silver or gold necklace for his wife. And these women had many, many necklaces. But while he found the Rus beautiful, he also found them kind of disgusting. As a highly educated member of Islamic society, hygiene was both a religious and social requirement. Hand washing, teeth cleaning, and regular bathing were the norm in Ibn Fadlan's world. But not so for the Rus. He described their hygiene habits with revulsion, telling us that they lived in long houses with 10 or 20 people to a house. Each household would wash their faces, spit, and blow their nose each morning in a communal wash bin without changing the water. They had no sense of privacy when it came to having sex or answering the call of nature. They didn't wash their hands before eating or ever really. And perhaps most humorously, Fadlan found their singing to be just awful. They are the filthiest of God's creatures, he wrote. Indeed, they are like wild asses. And the Rus weren't just gross in his eyes. They were polytheistic pagans as well, a particularly abhorrent and exotic group to medieval Muslims. But Ibn Fadlan's mixed feelings of attraction and revulsion aren't just valuable to us as an amusing tale of culture clash between an Islamic scholar and some very sexy, very stinky Vikings. The Vikings themselves were a largely oral culture that left no written accounts of their own traditions. So Ibn Fadlan's travel writing is actually the only first-hand account we have of some Viking traditions. But it's also important to acknowledge that his account of the Rus might not be representative of all Vikings. The Rus had lived in Eastern Europe for about a century at that point, and undoubtedly absorbed many local practices. In fact, he may not have understood what he was seeing, and we aren't even sure who served as his translator and whether or not they knew what they were talking about. But thanks to Ibn Fadlan's obsession with recording in detail everything from daily habits to religious practices, we at least have a window into how one group of Vikings conducted themselves. And the most famous example of this is the Viking funeral. Ibn Fadlan was horrified to discover that the Rus cremated their dead, a concept which, you guessed it, also fascinated him. It so happened that a Viking chief recently died, and the Rus allowed this strange foreigner to witness the funeral. And this is the summary of what he saw. First, they buried the corpse in a shallow grave with offerings of bread, beer, and a lute, allowing them ten days to sew the funeral clothing. They also gathered the family's enslaved people together and asked for a volunteer who was willing to die for their master. 
After a pause, a young woman spoke up and said that she would do it. Once she volunteered to be the human sacrifice, Fadlan tells us, there was no going back. Two people were assigned to stay with the volunteer night and day to make sure she didn't have any second thoughts. After the funerary clothing was complete, they dragged the chieftain's boat up onto dry land and an old woman who was to perform the ritual sacrifice, referred to as the Angel of Death, arranged a lavish bed of Byzantine brocade and cushions upon the deck. Then they exhumed the chieftain's body, dressed him in his funerary clothes, and propped him up on the bed, also filling the ship with all manner of things, herbs, spices, beer, bread, and fruit. Then the animal sacrifices began. They ritually slaughtered chickens, horses, cows, and even a dog, and arranged the bodies on the boat. And finally, when the time came, the human sacrifice. The woman who volunteered, in kind of an ecstatic trance after days of drinking and singing, enters each hut in the village. Now, what happened there is difficult to understand, given that it comes to us filtered through Ibn Fatlan and an unknown translator, neither of which may have understood what they were witnessing. But it does seem like there was some sexual component to the ritual, likely one that was violent and non-consensual. She was then brought out and lifted up three times, once in honor of her father and mother, once in honor of her ancestors, and a final time in honor of the man she was about to die for. Then they took her to the ship, where she met the Angel of Death for the final time. She gave her bracelets to the old woman, and in return, she received a bowl of beer to drink. The volunteer then sang a song to bid farewell to her loved ones. Men with wooden staffs and shields gathered, and began to beat them percussively. It covered the noise as the young woman was simultaneously stabbed and strangled. And with the sacrifice done, they set the boat alight. As Ibid Fadlan watched the flames of the funeral boat blaze, thinking on all of the ritual brutality he'd just witnessed, a ruse nearby turned and spoke to him. His interpreter translated, You Arabs are foolish, the ruse said. Why is that? Ibn Fadlan answered. You take the person who is the most beloved to you and the most respected among you, and you leave them in the ground, so that the earth, the insects, and the worms consume them. We burn them with fire in an instant, and they enter paradise forthwith from that very moment. Because of the great love that their god has for them, he sent the wind to carry them off to the afterlife. Within the space of an hour, the Rus laughed. Ibn Fadlan considered this. By no means did the spectacle of the funeral make him question his own religious practices, but the Viking was right. An hour did not pass before the boat, the girl, and the Viking chief had all become dust blown on the wind. Ibn Fadlan's account is not only useful in what it describes, but how it also forces us to think about the overlapping biases and filters contained even in a first-hand account. Is he an unimpeachable witness or misunderstanding events? Was this ritual a standard practice among Vikings or a blend unique to these Rus? But perhaps what Ibn Fadlan's account does, more than anything, is tell us about his own culture, how he could be both attracted and repelled by strange customs, how he reacted to religious violence, and how a cultured, curious Islamic scholar perceived the world when he was very far from home. Once again, thanks so much to Audible for sponsoring this episode. Now, I know I've mentioned this before, but I really do have trouble just finding time to read. Who knew show running a YouTube channel would be so much work? Oh, everyone did. All right, fair enough. But that's why I love Audible and their countless audiobooks, podcasts, and Audible originals that I can listen to while cooking, working out, or even playing a game. And actually, Rob just recommended an audiobook to me that I think is super thematically appropriate. Michael Crichton's novel, Eaters of the Dead. A fictional tale told from the perspective of Ibn Fadlan, who instead of going home to Baghdad, joins up with the Vikings and finds himself witnessing the events of Beowulf. Yeah, because, you know, Grendel, uh, finds a way. And because Audible offers free and easy audiobook exchanges and member credits can roll over for a year, I can engage with all their cool stuff at my own pace. So, for a 30-day free trial, plus your first audiobook and two Audible originals for free, visit audible.com slash extra credits. Legendary thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Casey Muscha, Dominic Valenciana, Gunnar Clovis, Kyle Murgatroyd, and Orioles One. 